Mm-hmm, 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 Hey everybody, it's your buddy Beard Grizzly, and we're going to continue this trip down memory lane. I mean, if you really want to count anything past in Destiny at all anymore. Well, never mind. I guess things change in some cases, huh? And no, I'm still not over this. Matchmaking or whatever, I still think having the option to select whichever forge I want to go into would be nice and still add in the matchmaking button. <coughs> The Black Armory has been one of my favorite additions to the Destiny universe. Personally, I think it was very well handled, though it requires some suspension of disbelief to think the Vanguard or others didn't know it existed. But with it out of operation and lacking a forge, it's not like it posed a threat or a service to anyone, so pretty low on the ladder, I suppose. Ada 1 has a pretty storied history. In fact, she'd be able to tell us a thing or 20 about the early days of the Collapse. She has an alternative view of Guardians, as her vision is clouded by the events that led to the death of her mother. She doesn't see us as a collective, protective group. She thinks of us as the warlords of old, looking to pillage and rule instead of serve and protect. The Black Armory itself was founded on the ideas of humanity first, in a lot of regards. The Traveler isn't our salvation, and being prepared for what was to come is what the families of the Armory valued. Mayrey, Rasmussen, Satwa, create equipment that the public could handle, prepare for what was to come without trust in the Traveler. To a degree, I would say that philosophy was sound. I mean, the tech was made possible because of the Traveler, but that's neither here nor there, right? None of this is new info, but the setup for the Black Armory, both now and previously, is important to know, as I feel it sets up today's information and theory. If you'd like a much more in-depth look to this information, then I just got done making three videos that look over varying levels of detail for the Black Armory papers. I'm literally trying to please everyone, and I'm sure I will please no one. Oh well, thus is life. Anyway, the question in the title. Why is the Black Armory so important? What does it have to do with the Awoken? Well, without the Armory, we wouldn't have most of the progression of the city's structures and buildings. The engineering might be leagues behind what we have today. Our weaponry may not be as well constructed, either. At least, in my mind. I've always been a fan of connective tissue and storytelling, so for me, I see things as being interlinked. I don't expect that to always be the case of so many moving pieces within the lore of this game, but sometimes it's very hard to ignore when the pieces fall together. You see, Ada and the families of the Armory may not have planned to give us, the Risen, and the city in particular, their knowledge and equipment, but it may have fallen into our laps from some of our early interactions with the Awoken. I'm leaving this vague still early on just to see if you can connect some of the dots before we really get into things. That being said, I think it's time to get into things. This theory starts with how the Black Armory's tools and forges were handled towards the beginning of the Collapse. The families had agreed early on to not involve Clovis Bray, the major tech and scientific company that they were during the Golden Age. I mean, in general, it would go against their philosophies. Clovis Bray valued the knowledge and information the Traveler gave to humanity, and through this knowledge they had constructed massive colony ships that were to be used in finding new places for humanity among the stars. They created Exotech, and as we know more of Rasputin and the weapons armory that was created through his knowledge, along with the Hephaestus Index and so on, well, Clovis Bray really liked what they could find out from the Traveler and the knowledge of light that it granted humanity. And of course, possibly the hive that was sitting underneath Rasputin, but you know. Meanwhile, the armory valued people and how humanity could be just fine on Earth. It is our home, after all. They believed more in the tangible, not the intangible. It was as much a righteous idea as it was a short-sighted one to see past their own veil. With time, that barrier started to decay. 
well, time and a very persistent Rasmussen Forge Master. Eventually, the armory worked with Clovis Bray with the express intent of keeping all of the information and technology they had amassed to themselves. This was not meant as a collaboration, but instead meant to supply additional funds and backing. Of course, Traveler knows that Clovis Bray had a way to reverse engineer some pieces of the forges themselves. In other ways, well, making the arguably most perfect EXO out there. Tell me another EXO with the number one next to their name. Over the span of several entries within the Black Armory papers, we see the impact that Helga has on Henriette's decision making for the armory. In entry 41, we see Henriette questioning how the armory is progressing. She feels she should be thrilled that it is, that they're a successful group and that their equipment and forges are doing very well. But Henriette never expected for a mobile weapon factory to be created. She wanted to keep things a bit more under control, to know who received the equipment the armory created and keep things mostly in-house. But the armory, as Helga would remind Henriette often, was as much a business as it was a cause. And so, Henriette, having the final say, allowed the Black Armory's forges to be used outside of their own view and work with whoever else might be interested in them. In Entry 50, we see the first talks of Helga attempting to shift Henriette's mind to allow for a joint project between Clovis Bray and the Armory to work on Exos. Henriette really tries to draw the line here, but after further convincing and an unknown amount of time passage, she approves it in Entry 67. Entry 68, however, is when the darkness attacks. The Exo project with Clovis Bray may not have ever gone forward, save for the lone member of Project Niobe, Ada-1. But even if that's not the case, the weapons forges did go live, and we need no further proof of that than the two that were loaded on Exodus Black. Failsafe was sitting on a couple of weapons gold mines and never even knew it, or never chose to access the information. We're unsure where the Volunder Forge was located before the Cabal possibly picked it up, at least over on Earth. But the Bergusia Forge within the Niobe Labs? Well, that's easy to explain, given the time the Armory had within those walls when defending themselves and finishing Ada-1. And so we have our first puzzle piece. Four forges, with two loaded on a colony ship called Exodus Black. A quick note. I know it odd and weird that only Exodus Black seemed to be loaded with not one, but two of these forges, and yet we had no idea about any of the other colony ships. This generalized piece isn't expanded upon, and it desperately needs to be, considering the other colony ships in the Cosmodrome alone. How many more are there that were loaded before the collapse hit? Was Exodus Black just that lucky? Let's continue. Enter the Marasena, and in particular, the Yang Lai Wei, aka Exodus Green, Ship Spire, the home of the Awoken, or at least their knowledge center. If not for this vessel, which seems to have been even larger than normal colony ships, the Awoken would not be among us. At this point, I'm sure those interested in the Mara Sena have reviewed it and looked through it. I would assume you at least know the name of Yang Lai Wei or Exodus Green if you have looked through it. If not, then no, it's the first place that we see the Awoken being born and how they come to be. Aboard this ship spire was information the Awoken held sacred, which is all of the information we had loaded to help the colonies. What else was aboard this colony ship is unknown. Two entries from the Mara Sena give us some hints, but one calls my attention more than the other. The first is Extatiate 3, in which the Awoken are setting ground rules for themselves, their legal and moral systems, if you will. Not to make them sound like Exos or a bunch of robots or anything, just they needed some ground rules, you know? That's how culture works. Politics, and oh boy, let's not go there. They talk about U-Tech, which translates to good technology, if we pull the base of the words. U comes from Greek, meaning good, normal, or well, among others. Here we see that those who would practice or acknowledge this U technology were called U techs. Uh, that's a bit of side trivia, really. Also, so we assume, they would also turn and be changed to being called techunes, but we're not entirely sure on that one. 
But it is important to know that the opposite also existed. In Fideicide 2, we learn that Maltec also exists. Mal from Latin means bad or ill. So this is bad technology. The defining factors for the awoken of what was considered good or bad was what could wound or what could destroy completely. In the case of this entry, the current awoken queen named Alice Lee gave a few of these weapons to women she would trust and ones she could not live without. It's not that these weapons didn't exist, but they were locked away and under heavy supervision and lock and key. The weapon in question is described as a matter laser, a coherent boson weapon. There is someone that is targeted by this thing in Fidea Side 2, and there is nothing left of that target whatsoever. They are completely vaporized. So how do we define a coherent boson weapon? Well, science today is trying to do the same thing. Proposition after proposition is being developed, and the goal is to make, really, a laser rifle of some kind or some effect. The only degree here that would be consistent between everything is how they would use fusion technology. Fusion rifles are largely what we could relate this boson weaponry to, and one of the first ones that seemed to be in the works that took advantage of actual fusion core technology from the Golden Age? No, not Arbalist, not Bastion, those are kinetic, we already know that. Look no further than Jotun. A fusion rifle with a single blast point that acts on a solar core. Any closer to fusion energy and you may have to go to the sun itself. This is not to say the Awoken did not have use of fusion rifles within their ranks or develop their own, but they may have only been slightly used until Mara Sov saw those willing to follow her back into our portion of reality. Mara has given us and developed fusion rifles already, like Tekion Force, for instance. But the Awoken operate on smaller arms for the most part, it seems. I know we're skipping around the Mara Senna a bit, but just to drive this point home, in the entry entitled Impotent 4, Uldren Solve and Shur Ido are in a dueling match. The match is set as a hunt, and so they choose rifles for this part of the duel. Shur chooses a Tiger Spite rifle. Uldren chooses something similar to a Vash Safe Scout rifle. This is at least to say the technology of the Awoken hasn't changed a bunch from what we see of them today. And who knows how many centuries ago this duel even took place. That's just to drive home the idea of their weapons tech and how it's developed. Along with the bows, sidearms, and other equipment we hear of being used in the Mara Senna, not much seems to have changed in their current use of weapons and equipment from the distributary to our realm again, and the focus on the weapons and the distributary were weapons that could kill, but focused more on wounding rather than much else, with the goal being to preserve an immortal life as one of the tenants made by the Awoken in Extatiate Three. And so we have Puzzle Piece 2, Utec, Maltec, and the Awoken People. Okay, with all of that out of the way, you might be scratching your head. What does the time and the distributary have to do with all of this for the Awoken? Link it all together. Bring the ifs and coulds in place. If Failsafe and the Exodus Black had two of the Black Armory forges loaded onto them, could Exodus Green have one as well? Could the Awoken be using this technology to create new weapons and thus have a basis for their engineering prowess? Could the Black Armory be the one to credit the way the Awoken built their civilization and had little need to progress it? I mean, look, I could even drive the moving light inside of the Awoken skin as being similar to the effects of the Obsidian Accelerated Forge weapon, but I'm not going to say that's true in the slightest. It's just a very funny comparison. But now the question, how is the Black Armory the one that saved us as well? Puzzle Piece 3. Coincidence, somewhat. Eventually trade needed to happen between the Awoken and the city. Even if it was once in a while or away from the eyes of the Queen, Awoken Tech started to work its ways to the original tents and hovels of the city. In the book Ecdices, the entry entitled Queen's Law introduces a character to us named Namchi. Namchi Sen was looking for crow drones that had been left around Earth when a fallen skiff had attacked his Hildian fighter. In trade for the repairs, 
he hands the city his Tiger Spite AR. Engineers work to reverse engineer and understand this piece of equipment. Suddenly, the city is reunited with a working piece of Forge Tech. And again, where this rifle comes from could make all the difference. But perhaps just some written logs isn't good enough for you. Perhaps you'd like to see some visual proof. Well, I'll give you a teaser here, but for now, I'd like to end things here. We'll go in-depth next time with a more vast look at city-based, awoken, and black armory weapons. The comparison of the sights and builds along with functions and what was created by whom is a rather long visual experiment that I hope you'll stick around and join me for. There's also some audible stuff there which I find funny. Otherwise, I appreciate you guys sticking around this long and listening to this theory. Is there anything off about it? Something that just doesn't make sense? Is the Black Armory really that important? Or is Bungie right to not make it a focal point at all anymore? I mean, in some ways, I guess they already have. If you'd like to be part of further and future discussions, then don't forget to hit subscribe on the way out, along with letting me know what you thought of this piece with the like and dislike buttons. Thanks again for being here, and to all of you, no matter when or where you are, I'll see you next space time. Take care.